Today I'm going to talk about the last of the amplifier classes that uh, that I had intended to. This is the class D amplifier. And we've already talked about the class A's, class AB's, the B's and the C's and how they have progressively gone up in efficiency but gone down in linearity and uh, their outputs tend to be a pretty pretty much distorted. Well the class D amplifier has to use a lot of a lot of components to do the uh, the magic that it does. Uh, take an input, uh, essentially sample it with a sawtooth wave. Well, not really sample it, but uh, check its levels with a sawtooth wave. Reintegrate it so you can listen to it at the output. And we'll talk about how that's going to work throughout this circuit. And the device we're using is going to be from Sure Electronics. This is a little kit that I bought. Oh, a few months ago and finally got around to uh, assembling and and testing and this uses the uh, Texas Instruments TPA 3122 D2 chip which uh, you can get for about five bucks this whole kit costs I think it was around twenty dollars or twenty five dollars it's uh it's made in in China uh, it doesn't have uh, the best components. Most of these capacitors are are really no-name devices, and you can do better by, for example, buying some of the Panasonic uh, series of uh, low ESR caps, and you can get better inductors. But this is a it's a pretty neat device because this can take in a very small signal and put out up to 30 watts uh, combined from from the two channels. Uh, 15 watts per channel into a 8 ohm device. If you're using 4 ohms, the the maximum power out goes down to 10 watts per channel. But it's still it's, it's a pretty amazing device, and we're going to go over you know the class D principles, how a class D amplifier works, and this one in particular, and look at the output, and maybe do a little bit of work on testing the efficiency. So let's get started. Here's a simple block diagram of how a class D amplifier might be arranged. We start out with a comparator that has two inputs, the audio that we want to hear and a triangle generator. And the triangle generator switches the output of the audio on and off at whatever that rate is that the triangle generator is working at. And it changes this audio into pulses. So the output of our comparator is a is a, it's just a string of pulses whose width varies with the frequency and the amplitude. The how fast it changes left or right is a determination of frequency, and how far it changes left or right is a value that gives you the the amplitude. Uh, the next thing we end up having to do is take go take we take this small signal and run it into an amplifier and make it larger. Well, this signal being larger, so now we've gotten it amplified, and this is usually a, a MOSFET stage, or, or two MOSFETs, or, or transistors can be used as well. But we can't hear these pulses, so we go into a low-pass filter. And the low-pass filter consists of an inductor and a capacitor. And what will happen at that output is we will get a, and it won't be a, a thing of beauty quite often, a sine wave at the output and there's still going to be a lot of noise on here because remember when we have square waves we have a lot of harmonics in here and that low pass filter tries to remove as many of the harmonics as it can from that sine wave but there's always going to be some that are left so it's not really the if, if you're an audiophile uh, you are not going to use a class D amplifier for the for for your listening pleasure uh, they're great for efficiency. A lot of uh, amplifiers and automobiles uh, or cars use them, but uh, again, uh, not for professional use. So this low-pass filter, it takes these waves and kind of integrates them back into the a sine wave, which is an amplified version of, or is an amplified uh, variant of this. 
So this amplitude goes up and down, but it has a DC component at this point. So we have an AC output, a varying AC output with a DC component. So we have to go into a high pass filter to block the DC out of the out of that signal. That high pass filter can, is just a simple capacitor. Um, you want to want it to be pretty large and also have a low ESR, and it'll block out that uh, DC component. And now we have a a sine wave at the output, at least you know one that appear, appears or sounds pretty good. It's not going to be again spectrally pure. There's a lot of noise and junk in it. This is the block diagram for the TPA 3122D2. And it's fairly typical of a Class D amplifier circuit. It's got some really nifty features. It can put out that 30 watts that we were talking about into two channels. And the chip itself, which is only a 20-pin chip, as you can see here, the chip itself doesn't get hot at all. Uh, you can still you know, touch it. it. It does get warm, but it's a, it's a remarkable device in that it re really you know, dissipates very little energy in itself. So if we go through this chip pin by pin, you can see that we have uh, AVCC, so this is our, our uh, VCC voltage coming in on pin 16 and 17, and then there's an internal regulator in the device that gives us our our uh, digital voltages at the output. Uh, the pin 4 is the left in. We have uh, two pins, 7 and 8, and one of these is actually a digital ground and the other one is an analog ground. I believe 8 is the digital ground on this device. Uh, SD, so this is a a shutdown for the entire chip and it puts it into a low energy state and we activate that one by putting a low on the on that pin and the fine people at sure have set up a a little spot on the board where all you have to do if you want to mess you know put a switch into it uh, they've already set up a ground so all you have to do is put a uh, a single pole switch into this. The next uh, function is is mute and there's also a section uh, built onto the board and you can just put a switch into this and, and mute the device but this one works off of as you can see VDD so it works off of an active high. There are two gain switches in here. There's no volume control on this unfortunately and I'm and I'm certain, although I haven't looked at it closely, you can probably put in a, a few resistors into this and, and have a, a volume control. But make sure you use, or not resistors, but use a potentiometer. But make sure you use a, a logarithmic potentiometer because we're dealing with audio and a linear pot just won't work very well. The, uh, the two pins are 14 and 15. 15 is the, does the smaller changes, so this is the, the least significant bit and pin 14 is the most significant bit. And pin 5 is the right channel input. And then we have our outputs and, and V clamp. Uh, I'm going to kind of jump to this because it, the first pin up on the top is, um, is a, it's, a, it's a bootstrap uh, for the left channel. One of the problems that we have when we use something called an H bridge, and this is actually half of an H bridge, an H bridge is often used in motor control. But one of the problems we have is that the voltage from the gate to source on this top or high side MOSFET uh, which we haven't gone through and that's another series of lectures coming up but the the voltage because the lower MOSFET is is off the input is off it actually floats and we don't get really good voltages on the gate of this device so we have to put in a device called a bootstrap in this case it's a capacitor and this capacitor is going to charge to the V clamping voltage and to uh, some value of VCC and what this does is it makes sure that we have a good high voltage on the the base of this or on the gate of this high side MOSFET to make sure it turns on. Remember, you know, we're dealing with audio so we do want some linearity even though if these are pulses coming out. If the pulses become, um, well, when I say non-linear, one amplitude, it switches on later or the amplitudes vary, you get distortions at the output. Class D amplifiers are, are very sensitive to variations in, in supply voltages and turn-ons and such. 
So we really want to make sure that those uh, are, are, are well, well established in the chip. So there is a, uh, a connection on here. It's just a simple capacitor on pin 18. And it gets some of the charging voltages from V-clamp, which is on pin 9. And it makes sure that both of these high sides turn on at, at the right time. And then, of course, we have our, our left out and the, the power uh, ground for the low side and the uh, VCC uh, for, the, for the top side and the same thing down here. We have our bootstrap for the right side, uh, PVCC, that's the high side uh, value, the low side value, and then, of course, the R out. And remember, all of this is, is, are just pulses that are going to come out and they're going to vary, you know, in in amplitude, if I can get my append to write again, it just gave up the ghost. So these these are going to vary. The amplitudes are going to be constant, but you know the time that the pulses are on for is going to is going to change. So we have these pulses coming out, and now we have to reintegrate this back into some kind of a function functional uh, audio or sine wave that we can actually listen to. This is the schematic for the actual uh, Sure Electronics amplifier and here's your pit here's your your IC the two inputs and then we have uh, the the voltage input and this can be anywhere from I believe it was 12 volts up to about 28 volts and you need the 28 volts when you're trying to get that 15 watts out of each channel on, on 8 ohms a diode to prevent any uh, problems if you should accidentally hook up the voltages in reverse and the power connector, uh, they, they do provide a, a little plug right there. So, and here's our diode. And our mute and uh, shutdown controls. A power indicator LED, a little uh, green LED right there. And then, of course, we have uh, for a shutdown, and these are our gain switches, so on. The main thing I want to point out at this stage is that when we look at this output, okay, uh, you can see that there are these large inductors that form part of the network that cleans the signal up. So here's our, our low pass filter. This is one part of it, L1. And then the other part of it is this 68 microfarad uh, capacitor at this point. So this forms our low pass network or our low pass filter. And what will happen at really low frequencies, when the magnetic field on, on, on this builds way up, it will, when that field, when that frequency changes, this magnetic field is going to collapse back into that inductor, and it's actually going to put voltage back into the device. And this is called power supply pumping. And it's not something that we generally want to have. And when we're dealing with single-ended amplifiers and these are single ended in that they have just uh, one high side or one output and then a then a common ground or a reference point on these single ended in uh, output devices at low frequencies this pumping will cause a lot of distortion and one of the ways that you can overcome power supply pumping is actually to bridge these two and make this entire unit a, a single channel and it'll increase the power but because now we have a, um, the, the left out and the right out hooked up to a single speaker, the problem is eliminated. Uh, what this, this, this hookup is called the bridge tide load or a BTL. With the bridge tide load, what we have is these channels are 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And the, those voltage or those va variations that occur in these magnetic fields cancel each other out so we don't get the, get the pumping back into the system that we had uh, with the single-ended design. The capacitors that are out here are designed to eliminate that DC component which is still present at, uh, at the output of L1 and L2. Uh, remember, we do get the the AC signal back at this point and this point but it's riding on a DC level and these capacitors eliminate that that DC so we get a a relatively uh, clean sine wave at these outputs the problem is that these filters they don't do a perfect job and we're going to end up with you can end up with uh, a lot of noise that it's it's really imperceptible to to most people 
but it is present and if you're really into the audio uh, this kind of stuff is just completely unacceptable so most of the times the audio guys will stick with a, a class a b amplifier because it's much cleaner what you're seeing here is the two hertz signal and that sawtooth wave is sampling it at uh, 250 kilohertz and you can see the the rate of change here is relatively slow it's at, at that two hertz and, it, and it's a very small variation between the two points uh, which indicates that the amplitude isn't very great and matter of fact I'm running at a hundred millivolts peak to peak if I had increase the voltage you can see that the distance that this wave is traveling or the on or the duration of this wave is increasing up and down and that gives us our amplitude at the output now unfortunately because of the way that the components were selected for the this board by the manufacturer I can't really show you that 2 Hertz output because the the critical frequency is is higher at the output all you would see would be a flat line so what I'm gonna do is I'll show you how this looks when we increase the signal to a frequency of of 20 Hertz well, there's a view of the 20 Hertz being modulated or being adjusted by our sawtooth and again we really can't see that and if I now zoom out time wise go to smaller and smaller slices of time you can see that as these become uh, integrated through the, the low pass filter and we take out the the DC we have our sine wave on on the output again and if I go up in frequency a little bit more uh, our amplitude will probably go up as well uh, not much but that's because we're getting farther and farther away from that cutoff frequency eventually it'll, it'll just flatten out and at this point I'm, I'm at 160 Hertz and you can see it's a it's a pretty clean wave this is a shot of both of the channels being operated with a 250 millivolt 1 kilohertz input signal and you can see that both channels they they're identical um, the right channel is in yellow uh, left channel is in blue and you can see on the meter that I am drawing 486 uh, milliamps from the power supply at 19.94 volts and the voltage on the output and remember this is peak to peak so we'll just have the have the scope do the measurement and the output for for a single channel is 16 well and we'll use the lower value 16.8 volts peak to peak so let's go ahead and find out what kind of efficiency we're getting from this class D amplifier with some pretty simple math we can find out what the efficiency of our amplifier is you recall that we had 486.15 milliamps and 19.943 volts so that comes out to 9.69 watts so we'll just round that to 9.7 watts you'll also remember that we had 16.8 volts peak to peak well we can't compare peak to peak to to wattage uh, DC wattage we have to convert this to RMS and we can divide 16.8 by 2.828 and that'll give us 5.94 RMS using one of the power formulas which is V squared over R giving you power we get we find out that uh, in an 8 ohm speaker we have a power coming out of 4.41 watts the, the uh, speakers I was using while well, they weren't speakers they were resistors and they were non inductive and that's pretty important because if we start using actual speakers at those those points the the readings are going to change so we want to you know use something that's a little bit more stable and doesn't kick power back into the system so 4.41 watts two of them so the total into both of the channels was 8.82 uh, or the complete uh, total power output from our amplifier was 8.82 watts and you'll remember that uh, the efficiency of a system is power out over the power that was consumed in total times 100 
Well, at 8.82 watts uh, out and 9.7 watts coming in times 100, we had an efficiency in this amplifier of 90.93% or about 91%. So that's, that's pretty darn good. So Class D amplifiers they are really, really efficient, but they have, just have all that uh, nasty little bit of noise that we have to get rid of with uh, the low-pass filters up here. We have to get rid of DC. Of course, we have to have have a, a fancy circuit here that'll do uh, create a, a ramp oscillator or a sawtooth waveform, and then a comparator. So the complexity of, uh, in Class D goes way, way up, but the the payoff in efficiency is is definitely there. So hopefully I've, I've covered all the topics that need to be. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them. So anyways, uh, next time I think I'll start going into uh, JFETs and MOSFETs, comparing those to uh, the transistor circuits that we've done earlier, and see how they vary and how to implement some of those configurations in circuits that we've already done.